Ego, Slendy, Ego, Slendy, Ayy. Hit it up the park. Hit it with a strike. From the national anthem to the bottom of the night. I'm in Slendy, Ego, Slendy, Ego, Slendy, Ego, Slendy, Ayy. You already know what's up. What's that? Another home run. But you know the job ain't done. Till we hold that trophy up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 447 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fadden with you here. It is August 16th, 2023, a late night edition of Talking Friars. The Padres just won their series against the Baltimore Orioles. The Baltimore Orioles are the same team that have been a really good baseball team all season long. They entered this series, I believe, with the best record in the American League, over 70 wins. They just got back Cedric Mullins. They had one of their trade di- trade deadline additions, Jack Flaherty, starting in this series. And the San Diego Padres, what they've done multiple times this year, they have been able to beat one of the best teams in baseball despite being under 500 and not being one of the best teams in baseball. Will this turn around the entire season? We shall see. I'm not going to jump on that bandwagon. I don't think that they're back. But... I'm sure going to enjoy what happened tonight at Petco Park. I'm sure going to enjoy watching Nando on repeat steal home. I'm going to enjoy another great Blake Snell performance. I'm going to enjoy Michael Walker returning last night. I'm going to enjoy Gary Sanchez, his grand slam last night. I did a breakdown on that, by the way. And I'm going to enjoy an amazing catch by Jake Cronenworth, full extension at first base. Now, again, there's work to do. Are they back? I don't think they're back. But it did feel a little bit different at Petco Park. On Monday when I was, I was there, I know the Padres lost that game, but it looked dead. It felt dead. There was like no one in Gallagher Square, and I know it was back to school and all that, but it just felt off. And it felt like fans of Petco Park realized, yeah, this is probably not going to be the year. And now I know that today it was a giveaway day. The hoodie, I think it looks pretty good. I think it's black, not brown, which is kind of weird. Um, my mom pointed that out when I got home today. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, it's black, not brown. Anyway, because I think it is black. It looks black, which is weird because that's not a Padres color. But so anyway, I know it was giveaway night, and so it was going to be sold out, but it still felt different. The energy in the ballpark, It just felt different. And of course, it helped that the Padres won, right? If they didn't win, then that energy would not have been there late in the game, right? But it felt, I'm not going to say it felt like a playoff atmosphere because I'm not going to go there because that's a different level. But it felt big game atmosphere for sure. I'll say that. And it was good to get this series win against the Baltimore Orioles. Again, there's going to have to be work that's put in by this Padres team. There's going to have to be more wins earned by this Padres team because they're chasing teams. It's not like they can just play 500 baseball and go be a postseason team. They're going to have to play much better than that. And the good news is they're playing in the National League, not the American League. So other teams that are in front of them are not as strong as the other teams that are up there in the wild card race in the American League, right? So thank goodness that we are in the National League this year, right? And that's our league because. The Cubs did win tonight, by the way. That was an amazing highlight to watch. Christopher Morrell with that walk-off home run, and he takes his jersey off, his shirt off, rounding the bases. The Wrigley crowd in that Chicago rivalry there, that was amazing. You should go watch that if you have not already. Um, What a highlight that is. That's probably going to be in MLB's highlight package for this season. Like That's how electric that moment was. Um, They won today, but I believe the Marlins lost. And did the Diamondbacks lose? I think the D-backs lost as well before they come in. No, 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 they won. Sorry. 9-7. But still, there's going to be teams ahead of the Padres that lose. And I think that this last month and a half of this season, it's going to show, like, okay, maybe these teams that were ahead of the Padres, sure, they had a good four and a half months, good four months of this season, but... Were they really built to withstand the entire regular season? Were they built to go all the way through the regular season 
and not just have success in the first four months and then kind of fall off, right? And the Padres, they haven't gotten going yet, and they're in this wild card race. So I think if you're looking for positives, you take that, and you think that, well, the D-backs, Marlins, Cubs, the teams that are ahead of the Padres, they're not going to continue playing as well as they did earlier in the year. Now, that's not a guarantee. They could keep playing well, and the Padres won't make the postseason. But if you're looking for hope, that's the hope. But again, my opinion right now, it hasn't changed about this team. Just like I said, I think I said on my pregame thoughts today, I'm sure I said it at some point during this series or going into this Baltimore series, winning this series is what I wanted. I went in not expecting them to win the series because it's the Baltimore Orioles, and look how they were playing going into this series. Terrible. And then they lost the first game of this series, right? So we were not feeling good after that. But they turned it around. And so, yeah, I'm happy with the series win, obviously. But that doesn't erase the poor play that was going on going into this series. That doesn't erase the Juan Soto quitting quote, right? That doesn't erase some of the things that have happened this season. I'm not going to get over that just because they won two out of three against the Orioles. As I said in my postgame reaction, they won the season series against the Braves, right? They swept the Texas Rangers, who were one of the best teams in the American League, just like the Baltimore Orioles. And what happened after that? They didn't continue playing great baseball like that, right? So they've got to continue it. That's what matters the most. All right, we're going to get into these two game, these last two games of this series. I did go over the first game of the series on a previous show. We can touch on that, but we know the story of that, right? We know what happened. Uh, reminder, SeatGeek code, talking for hours, $20 off your order there. BreakingT.com, click that link in the description. You, If you click that link, Great San Diego Sports Swag, Padres, Aztecs, Wave, you will find that with BreakingT.com, and I'll tell you more about Underdog Fantasy and Gaglione Bros in a little bit. And either tomorrow or on Friday, probably on Friday, I'll have an interview out with Jim Callis. At least that is scheduled um, for later this week. Jim Callis, MLB prospect guru. He will tell us about the Padres farm system, who they dealt at the deadline. Was that that big of a deal? Will they be missing those guys? An update on Ethan Salas and Jackson Merrill, who are two top 10 prospects in Major League Baseball, or excuse me, in Minor League Baseball, I should say. Uh, but on MLB.com's prospect list, they are in the top 10. Um, special talents there. So I think that's going to be a fun episode for those that want to know more about who's coming up for this Padres team, because that is important as well. All right, quick break, and then we'll get into these last two games of this Baltimore Orioles San Diego Padres series. Check out Gaglione Bros' famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries on Friars Road. You can visit their website, gaglionebros.com, for their entire menu and enjoy their cheesesteaks and fries at Petco Park and Snapdragon Stadium as well. All right, let's start with Tuesday's game, and then we'll talk about what happened earlier tonight. Again, for the podcast listeners, for those that are watching on replay on YouTube, you're probably watching or listening to this on Thursday, August 17th. But this is a late night edition of the show because the series is over. So this is my series reaction coming home from the ballpark. So that's why I'm a little bit later. Um, talking about Tuesday's victory. It was really good to see Michael Walker come back. He was definitely missed. He was obviously on the shelf for a while there battling that shoulder injury. Pitches five innings, three hits, no runs, one walk, five punch outs, ERAs, two, six, eight. Obviously, we know how important Michael Walker is to this team. And how good he has pitched this season. He's been really good. You know, pitcher of the month in what, month of May? I think that was before Snell won it in June. I think he should have won it in July as well. But that's another topic for another day. Um, now, I think the big thing with Waka is like, cool, cool. He had a good performance on Tuesday. But let's see how he can do the rest of the year. Can he stay healthy? How does he bounce back in his next outing? That's going to that's gonna be important for me. Um, but... Still, really good, solid outing for Michael Walker, and then Wilson an inning, Barlow a couple innings, Garcia had a big lead, so it was okay that he gave up a couple runs. That's his role, right? Pitching in those big blowouts, that is his, that's his role now. And the Padres' offense in this game, 10 runs, 10-3. to three. I mean, it was great. Like, from the get-go, they took advantage of Jack Flaherty. I did that breakdown, which is out on the YouTube channel about just the at-bats that they had, good at-bats. They weren't chasing pitches. 
And if it wasn't their pitch, but it was a strike, they were fouling it off and making Jack Flaherty beat them or make a mistake, right? And Flaherty didn't really beat the Padres, right? He was making more mistakes. And so good at bats, Ha Sung Kim right out of the gate with a double. Um, Manny, Xander, obviously Gary with a grand slam. Crony with the walk to set up, I believe, the Gary Grand Slam. Like, really good at-bats, tired out Jack Flaherty. And then it wasn't just first inning, really good first inning. They added on after that. Two runs in the second inning, just Manny putting the ball in play. Three runs in the fifth, couple doubles. It was good to see. You know, even Ben Gamble got in, the, got in on the action. Now, I still think it's dumb that he was DHing tonight, but we can get into that in a little bit. But yeah, it was a feel-good win. But I think a lot of Padres fans weren't super excited about the win. Like, they were obviously happy when it was going on. It was great, the Grand Slam and all that. But they were thinking about today. What was going to happen in the next game for this Padres team? Were they going to lay an egg like they had four times earlier this season after scoring double digits? Were they going to not do that and flip the script? and score some runs and go win tonight's game, this series finale, that's exactly what they ended up doing. So props to the Padres for doing that. But again, more work is to be done, right? This isn't it. There's still four and a half games back of a wild card spot, even with winning this Baltimore Orioles series. It's still going to be an uphill climb to get into a postseason spot. Their work is cut out for them. And it's a big couple series here against teams that are ahead of them, the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Miami Marlins, it would be very helpful for the Padres to go win these two series here. Arizona won because they just lost that series, and it's a four-gamer. So if you can take three out of four, you gain two games on the Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks right now sit a game and a half back of a playoff spot. Padres four and a half. So D-backs have a three-game advantage. So get closer to Arizona. And when that Miami series comes around, we'll see what Miami does. They're playing the Dodgers up next. So they just finished with the Astros. They're going to be playing the Dodgers. So maybe the Miami Marlins will not be playing good baseball going into this Padres series starting next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the Padres can take advantage of that, hopefully. And maybe the Padres will be right neck and neck with the Marlins at the end of that Miami series. Maybe that's asking too much. Um, but that's obviously just the optimistic part of me wanting to believe that this is something i don't believe that this is something yet i'm just happy that they won this baltimore series baltimore series because that's what they had to do but i'm not gonna fool myself and yeah you know get tricked into thinking that they're back because they had a good series against the baltimore orioles you know because look at what they did in the games before that right good win here good couple wins but still even with these good couple wins their last 10 games they're three and seven they got embarrassed by the Dodgers. They quit against the Mariners, and they lost a series to the Diamondbacks, a team that had won, that had lost, excuse me, nine games in a row going into the second game of that Padres D-back series uh, last weekend. So, you know, I'm not forgetting that. Like this is great, but again, their work is cut out for them. Um, was there anything I wanted to mention? Yeah. So, the Michael Walker thing. I wanted to talk about what could happen with Michael Walker. Should they take Michael Walker's club option, which they can do? So this is what would happen with Michael Walker. This is his contract right now. So $16 million club option for next year and $16 million club option for 2025 that the Padres can take. But here's the thing. The Padres would have to pick up those club options at the same time. So if they pick up the club option for 2024, they're also picking up a $16 million club option for 2025. Do they want to give Michael Walker $32 million combined over the next couple seasons after this season when he has had an injury history? This is only one season. Shoot, he had an injury this year that he's just coming back from. Do they want to do that? Or do they want to make an effort at bringing back Blake Snell? Obviously, he's pitching like the best pitcher in baseball right now. So there's questions here. If the Padres don't take those club options there for Michael Walker, then Michael Walker can opt into a $6.5 million player option for 2024. There's a player option for 
$6 million for the year after that. And then there's a $6 million player option for the year after that as well in 2026. But obviously those player options come if he takes the player option for the year prior, right? Do I see the Padres or do I see Michael Walker taking those player options? No, I don't. Um, he's pitching too well unless he gets hurt at the end of this season. And even then he might not take it because six and a half million dollars, he would easily make that on the free agent market, I think. Easily. The way he's pitching, sub three ERA, pitcher of the month. I mean, I think he was in the conversation to be one of the all-star replacements in Seattle earlier this summer. Like he's pitching really well. And yeah, there's the injury risk, but he can definitely make that on the free agent market. So for me, I'm leaning towards giving Michael Waka those club options, taking those club options, and just, you know, hoping that there's not a whole lot of injuries over the next couple of years. Because if they let him go to free agency, then that's another starter you're going to have to bring in that's probably not going to be as good as Michael Waka, unless you're bringing in like Shoei Otani, right? Um, Probably not as good as Michael Waka. He's not going to be familiar with the organization coming in. And just who knows what the heck's going to happen there, right? And you can control how many starters you have in the rotation going into next year if you bring Waka back, right? Partly. You'll, you'd have Waka. You'd have, I think, Nick Martinez, if you want to include him competing for a starter spot. You'd have Darvish. You'd have Musgrove. Lugo, I believe there is a option on Lugo. Let me look up Lugo's contract here real quick. Lugo contract. Player option. Player option for $7.5 million. Maybe Lugo doesn't take that because he's pitching well this season. So I could see him not taking that and being a free agent. So let's say Lugo does take that, and they but they bring Waka back. That means that they will have at least three guys in that rotation for next year in Waka, Darvish, Musgrove. And then you can see what happens with Lugo, Waka, bring maybe one of them back, or you can bring Snell in, Snell back, I should say. And then there's free agent starters available, or you can make a trade. We'll see what, ha we'll see what happens there. But I think you might see the Padres Bring Michael Waka back, take those club options at the same time for 24 and 25, so they have that that starter, that third starter in the rotation. So they don't have to bring in another starter on top of that. And you just hope that Waka ends up not getting hurt. Because if they don't take that, they might end up having to pay more for Waka in free agency based on what other teams offer him. Right. So they can control things here. I'm very interested in seeing what that decision is going to be with Michael Walker. I'm interested in seeing what Seth Lugo does with that player option. Does he like it very much with the Padres? And if the Padres give him another starting opportunity in 24, will he take that player option and try to have another good year and then go into free agency the year after that and get a bigger contract because he can prove it back-to-back -back years of being a successful starter? We'll see what he does there. I would think Lugo doesn't take the player option. And... There's no way Waka's going to take the player options unless like something terrible happens to him this season, which obviously we're hoping doesn't happen because with Musgrove out especially, don't know if he's even going to return this season. Waka is a very important piece to this Padres team if they want to go to the postseason because he sets the Padres up well. He has a really good record these last couple seasons, win-loss record. And I know that doesn't mean as much as it did you know, a decade ago, right, where that was like the big stat, that in ERA. But when you have a good win-loss record, I know the offense has to perform, but you are doing, you got to be doing your job, right? You're not going to have a win, a, a tremendous win-loss record if you're giving up five runs a game. So he is doing his job. So I'd like to have, at this point, I'd like to have Walker back for next season. And for those that say, well, you're paying a lot of money, like, because there's other... Do you want to bring Gary back? Do you want to bring Snell back? Waka? That's, that's Lugo. That's a lot of guys that you're bringing back on a team that's under 500 that hasn't had a successful season. Do you want to do that? But what I would say to that is those players that I'm pointing out there, they've helped the Padres this year. It's not like that's Matt Carpenter or someone that just hasn't done their job this season that they're spending a bunch of money on and bringing back. 
those guys have helped the Padres this season get to where they're at right now, which is in striking distance. And I know some fans might not want to hear that because it, they just don't have a good record, but that's the facts. They're within striking distance of a playoff spot. That's for sure. All right. Glad I am. Uh, I touched on that Waka topic. Nando, he played center field on Tuesday as well. Is that going to be a long-term thing? Maybe if they find a trade for Grish, if they go get a corner outfielder in free agency next year or a trade in the offseason, right? Um, but now it's not a long-term thing. Like Grish, he was back in center field earlier tonight. But I wouldn't mind it. Like if the Padres fall out of a playoff spot, getting Nando comfortable in center field, having Ben Gamble go play right field and give Grish the carpenter treatment. I love watching Grish play center field. No doubt about it. And as someone that played center field, obviously not at a high level like Grish, but someone that loved playing center field, and I worked my butt off at that. And, you know, just I love chasing down balls in the outfield. Just loved it. Backing up the pitcher, you know, stealing outs away, right? I love that. Love watching Grish play. But the bat just hasn't been there. Um, and I don't know when the Padres are just going to give up on him. Will they ever give up on him? I don't know. But I'd be interested in seeing Nando get a little bit more reps in center field and see what he can do. Because we know he will turn into a gold glove center fielder if they give him the time, if they put the effort in, in helping him do that, right? Just like in right field. So that obviously was kicking around in my head when I saw Nando in center field last night, for sure. All right. That was really the, the main takeaways. Matt Carpenter got an at-bat last night, and if I was there, I would have probably stood up and give, gave him an ovation because he's just been such a great team player. And I know some on social media, so, so, what social media? Social media. Um, I know some have you know, given me some, some negative comments or whatever. When I say this about Matt Carpenter, about him being a good team player, they say, well, He's making millions of dollars. I'd be a good team player too, but this is different, right? One of the former first basements in this franchise's history, would he be doing what Matt Carpenter is doing if he was in this role? Or would he not be saying the things that Matt Carpenter is saying to the press, right? To the media. I, I just feel a little bit different. Like he is all into helping the Padres, doing whatever the Padres want. And he, uh, he, he understands the situation and he is i mean he wants to play obviously but he is fine with the role that he is in and he continues to put in the work hitting in the cages during games staying ready whenever to be ready when his name is called which it hasn't been but it was called upon last night obviously first time in like three weeks that he had gotten the box against live pitching in the big league so yeah of course he wasn't gonna you know have a lot of success he struck out but I like that he finally got to be back in the box. And as I've said previously, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to be someone that ever is going to say I hate Matt Carpenter, like I could say about another former first baseman in this franchise's history. I just see a difference there. So I did want to give props to Matt Carpenter again there. Um, okay, moving on to tonight's game. Padres, they get the win 5-2, to two, and Peco Park, it felt like a big game atmosphere. Like I said earlier in this show, props to Padres fans. They brought it. I know it was a giveaway night, so it was going to be sold out. It was a little bit earlier of a game, so maybe that encouraged parents to allow their kids to go to this game. I don't know, but whatever. Who cares what the reasoning was? Peco had a lot of energy tonight, and obviously part of the reason why was because the Padres played a good baseball game tonight. And Blake Snell continues to pitch well. Not a surprise. Just for anyone that has watched these Blake Snell starts the last couple months, last few months, to be honest, six innings, two earned runs, five punch outs, kind of limited the walks, two walks. I thought he could have gone longer, 92 pitches. I thought maybe they were going to try to run him out for the seventh because, I mean, let's face it, is Nick Martinez the best guy? Would you rather have Nick Martinez out there right now or Blake Snell? I'd probably rather have Blake Snell on the mound. But Nick, credit to him, won an inning, didn't give up any runs. Uh, Suarez in the eighth pitched that. Hater, glad to see he's alive. Hasn't pitched in forever, so it was good to see him pitch. He gets his 27th save of the year. An inning, couple punch outs, no walks. His ERA is .84 on the season. He's going to get paid in the offseason. I don't see the Padres being the team that pays him. 
But yeah, it was a good win. And obviously, I touched on the pitching there offensively. It was good. Tatis had a three-hit night, scored twice, obviously, stole home. We will get to that. Uh, Bogarts with an RBI single. Crony with an RBI single almost took the pitcher's head off. What a freaking play he made at first base, by the way. Full extension. It's up on the YouTube channel, I think, as a short, so you can go watch that. Or it's on my Instagram, Twitter, at Talking Friar, so you can check that out there if you did not watch the game. But I showed it up. I filmed the Jumbotron. Full extension at first base there. Uh, I tweeted out, I wonder how one of the former Padres first basemen would have done there. Would he have even tried to die for that ball? Probably not. And that's the difference between Crony and other guys. Just doesn't matter what's happening at the plate. He is doing better at the plate as of late, but it doesn't matter what's happening at the plate. He's not going to bring it with him onto the field. He's going to provide value on the field wherever he plays. So I love that about Crony. He's one of the leaders of the team. Not a big guy that, you know, leads by voice, if, if you will, like leads his talking, leads by example. You know, shows up every day, puts in the work, really cares about winning, cares about the city of San Diego, the fans, playing for the fans, winning for the fans. Um, and so, you know, I could, I could talk all day about Crony. Not just Crony, but there's other guys on the team that have those same qualities as well. Um, and Tatis, obviously, stealing home. I mean, I was watching, obviously, and a lot of fans were, but if fans were sitting at the ballpark tonight and they were on their phones, you missed Tatis stealing home. Like, that's how quick it happened. And it didn't feel like anyone was noticing what was going on. Like, Baltimore, I didn't hear them yelling or anything. And obviously, the pitcher on the mound had no freaking idea Tatis was going because he's a lefty, so his back was facing Tati at third. And Tati was just jogging down the line. I don't even know if he was trying to steal home at first, but he saw that third base was off. Third baseman was off of third, right? Away from the bag. So he got off as far as the third baseman was, then got off farther, started jogging, and then the pitcher did nothing, didn't move. And so Tatis just went for it and slid in. And as he was sliding in, the pitcher steps off. It's like, just a little late there, buddy. Just a little late. But yeah, that's. I mean, yeah, I was surprised that Tatis stole home because you just don't see people steal home like that, especially when there was no throw. Usually there's a throw and it's like wild because the pitcher's not expecting it and they panic or the guy's just safe. Maybe sometimes the guy gets out, but there was nothing because like no one was expecting it. Maybe we should have been expecting it because it's Tatis, but he's done this. Like I said in my post game reaction at Petco, he's done this, you know, maybe not stealing home. I don't think he has stole home yet uh, before tonight, but he has tagged from third on a shallow pop-up. Remember 2019 in Pittsburgh? Uh, was it Adam Frazier? It might have been Adam Frazier who caught that pop-up. And it was shallow right field. Tatis tags and scores. And that was when they were still wearing the blue Padres uniforms, obviously. I remember watching that on my couch, on television, and going nuts. Um, shout out to those who were watching every game along with me uh, in 2019 there. But, yeah, we've seen it since his rookie year. This guy is an electric factory. This guy is someone that you don't take your eyes off of. I know there's other fan bases that whenever Tatis pops up and it's not a home run, oh, need the steroids, I guess. Where's the ringworm? Blah, blah, blah. But they're just mad that he's not, a San he he's not on their team and he's a San Diego Padre, right? I am not going to take for granted that Fernando is wearing our uniform. He is in the brown and gold. He is a San Diego freaking Padre, uh, just like Manny Machado is a Padre. And just these great talents are San Diego Padres. And yeah, this season is not gone the way that we wanted it to. And it may end up not continuing to not go the way we wanted it to be, right? Uh, they might not make the postseason this year. but I still think they're set up pretty well going forward with the talent that they have on this team. And that's obviously me banking that the stars on this team won't have down years again next year or in 2025, right? Eventually, they will have start to decline because they're going to get older and these guys are locked in forever. I understand that and I don't think I'm going to get pissed off when that time comes because 
I knew what the Padres were getting into when those contracts were signed, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just hoping that they can turn this thing around this year, obviously, and they can go make the postseason and go make a freaking run at this thing, right? And if they don't, then come back next year, come back hungrier than ever next year, and don't have a down year again. And if that happens, they don't have a down year, then they're probably going to have success next year. That's for sure. Super Sticker, thank you so much, XO. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. If you have a chat along with that, feel free to put it in the comments because I don't see any chat alongside that. But thank you so much for that. I do appreciate that. In the chat, I'm going to get to you all. Uh, if you want to make sure I get to your comment or your question, you can click that uh, super chat button that it guarantees that I get your comment or your question. It se separates it into a different category, makes it very easy for me to see your comment, your question here tonight. Um, Exo says, love your commentary. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Even if you don't do super chats or whatever, hanging with me here live or on replay podcast platforms. I just love talking with Padres fans and, um, you know, running into some Padres employees today and them recognizing me and then us having a conversation about the Padres. Like it's not about me. It's about the Padres, right? Our common bond, our love with the San Diego Padres. And again, that's why I love communicating with you guys on the chat. And I invite fans to come join the live shows through that link that's pinned up at the top of the chat because I don't want to make it feel like I'm talking at you like maybe some shows do. I'm talking with you, you know? Um, so hopefully you guys can appreciate that. Ben Gamble was DHing tonight for the Padres. And on my pregame thoughts, I was not pleased with that decision. Why the heck is Ben Gamble DHing? Sure, had a good night yesterday. Cool. You know, the, the night that they gave Grish off. Cool, had a good night. But this guy is not a DH. This guy is not an offensive first player, period. He's been in the big leagues for a while, but most of it is because of his defense. It's not because he's going to go hit third for you in the lineup. And the DH is hitting eighth in this Padres lineup. Like, that should just show, like, wow. That's a big hole on this team. And I think that it shouldn't be a hole because Campy or Gary should be DHing when they're not starting a catcher, right? There's going to be one catching and there's going to be one not catching. So that person should be DHing, I think. Or you have Garrett Cooper be DHing, which wasn't the case tonight. They had Ben Gamble do it. And it's like Ben Gamble going into this. And, and this was, I looked this stat up after pregame thoughts or else I would have said it on my pregame thoughts. He's he, entering tonight, hit 171 in 24 games, 24 career games as a DH. I was surprised he had that many Major League Baseball career games at DH. I was shocked. I thought it was going to be like five, you know, like emergency situation DH because he's not a DH. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. And it just brought up the questions of urgency, right? Josh Hader, this, right? Like, I'm fine with the Matt Carpenter thing. Like, I'm... I wasn't at one point, but I understand that they don't really value that 26-man spot, and Carpenter has a contract for next year, so maybe they'll try again next year, or they'll try to attach him in a trade in the offseason. He's going to be on the roster the rest of the year, or else they, I think they would have already made a transaction. They would have already released him, DFA'd him, whatever, trade him at the deadline if they could find something. He'd be off the team already. So he's going to stay on it. I've accepted that. But the urgency with, like, Josh Hader, the guy hasn't pitched in a week, over a week, right? He pitches tonight, but it's like they're waiting for the perfect situation to pitch their best pitcher. That doesn't make sense. And I get it. Josh Hader, it's not all the Padres here. I don't want to make it seem like I'm blaming only the Padres about this. But Josh Hader needs to pitch more frequently than once a week. And he needs to pitch more frequently, based on where the Padres are, more than once every four days. Once every, yeah, you know? I get it. He wants to pitch ninth inning, closing situation, one inning. That's his preference, and he's probably made that pretty clear to the Padres. And he's trying to save himself for the contract that he's going to get, a bunch of money he's going to get if he continues to stay healthy this year in free agency. I get it. He's trying to protect himself. And I'm okay with that. I understand that. He's looking out for himself. His family wants to set up his family for the rest of his life. I totally understand that. But 
Why can't you pitch in the eighth inning? Why can't you pitch in the seventh inning? I'm not going to say, why can't you pitch in the fourth? That's egregious. But if the game is on the line in the seventh inning or in the eighth inning, you're up by a one and the best part of the opponent's lineup is up, why not pitch then? So you can at least get it to the ninth and then see what happens. And you can have another reliever pitch against weaker batters, right? And Bob Melvin, his argument is, well, someone's going to still have to close the ninth anyway. And I get that too. But a lot of the times this season, they haven't even gotten to the ninth because someone has come in, whether it's Nick Martinez or Brent Honeywell before he was off the roster, Robert Suarez even, I think a couple times, Stephen Wilson, Tom Cosgrove, I think a couple times. They come in and they give it up and they never get to Josh Hader. And that's why you see Josh Hader not pitch for a week plus. So if they want to capitalize on having Josh Hader in a Padres uniform, use him more often, please. Have Ruben Diablo have a conversation with Josh and be like, dude, we're going to protect you. We're not going to pitch you more than an inning. If that's what you want, I get it. But can you please be flexible here? Are you trying to win? Do you want to waste a year of your prime and not make the postseason this year? I don't think he wants to do that. So go be a team player. Pitch an inning. Save your arm. Protect your future. I get it. But be flex. Be a little bit flexible here. That's what I would say to Josh Hader. Again, I understand it has to be a tough situation that he's in. But, I mean, they need to win games here. If he only pitches the ninth inning the rest of the season, I don't know if the Padres make the postseason because they're probably going to blow some games that might cost them a postseason spot where those games, they never get to Josh Hader. You know? And the urgency thing about Ben Gamble and DHing, it's like, why? Why? The better lineup is with Gary and Campy in it, not Ben Gamble hitting eighth as your DH. Am I wrong on that? I don't think I am. So I think that, you know, I, I, again, I don't want to like make it seem like I'm bashing Josh Hader because I under, again, I understand the situation that he's in. But I'm just asking for him to pitch a different inning. Pitch maybe a little bit earlier in a game and it doesn't have to be the ninth inning and get to the ninth inning, right? Use him, Padres. Josh Hader, volunteer to pitch earlier in a game if that's what's needed to keep a lead later in a game. And then if the ninth inning happens and someone blows it in the ninth inning, okay, well, guess what? You at least got it to the ninth inning, and that person just didn't do their job. But the what ifs enter the, enter the conversation, right? Amongst us Padres fans and Bob Melvin in that manager's office. The what ifs happen when someone blows it in the seventh and the eighth. And we can be asking, well, what if Hader was pitched in this? What if he was using the seventh or the eighth? He shut that best part of the lineup down. And then Suarez or someone else came in in the ninth to face the bottom of the order or something. Would they have won the game there? What if? What if? What if? Right? I don't know if everyone agrees with me on that, but that's my thoughts on that. Um, was there anything else that stood out to me about today's game? So Tatis, three hits, you know, obviously stealing home there. That's obviously going to be the highlight of tonight. That's going to be one of the highlights of the season. When you think of Fernando's 2023 season, I think of some of the plays that he's made defensively, uh, throwing out guys at third, Throwing out guys at home, the throw when Austin Nola was still catching, right? The pick and the tag. I think it was against the Mariners. I remember that. Him stealing home here, the home runs. That's what I'm going to remember about the 2023 Fernando Tatis Jr. season. And maybe our, I'm going to remember some more things because some good memories are going to happen later this season, which obviously is what we hope for. But as of now, those are some of the things that stick out for me. Uh, him dancing to the crowd when they're chanting steroids. Adam, and he's just taking it like a champ. I'm going to remember that too. Uh, but it was a great night tonight. You know, like the offense showed up, top three guys in the order, Kim, Tati, Soto combined to have five hits, scored three runs, an RBI. Like that's what you want from the top three guys in the order. And then Bogarts and Crony, two of the bigger guys on this team, couple hits combined between them, couple RBIs. Like that's what you want to see. But again, I go back to great. 
Great series win, but they're going to have to do more. It doesn't stop here. It's not like they won this series and now they're in the postseason spot. They're still far ways away from a postseason spot. Things have to happen for them to be in a postseason spot. And if they get into a postseason spot, guess what? It's not over either. That's not the you can be happy if they get into a postseason spot, you know, at some point here in September or maybe even by the end of this month. But I'm not going to be jumping for joy because it's not over. You got to hold that. And we've seen a lot of losing this season from this Padres team, a lot of inconsistency from this Padres team. So if they start playing better baseball, I'm sorry. You can call me negative, but I'm going to still have that, those thoughts, those memories from earlier this season quote from Soto about quitting and the urgency quotes from earlier in the year, I'm going to have that in the back of my head and be like, don't fully get into this team. I mean, you can, but don't fully buy into this team unless you want your heart break, heart broken uh, at the end of this season. You know, if they play good baseball and then they go right back to who they were, you know, and they end up missing the postseason, you know, so it's just a warning. That's all I'll say. Um, but, you know, good couple wins. And now the Padres, they welcome in the Arizona Diamondbacks for a four-game series, not a three-game, four-game. Just play the D-backs, obviously, in Arizona over the weekend. Lost that series. Shouldn't have happened. Um, and Thursday, don't know if we should expect to win that game. Rich Hill for the Padres. He's still starting, which, as I've said already, shouldn't be starting. It probably should be Pedro Avila results-wise. Because Rich Hill's not putting the Padres in a position to win. Nine runs allowed in his two starts. It's unacceptable. And then he's facing Zach Gallon. So not expecting to win Thursday's game. Definitely not. And then Friday, it'll be Seth Lugo against, what's this guy's first name? Brandon Fott. Fott? That? Fott? I think that's the same pitching matchup as last Sunday. And then Saturday... Merrill Kelly against you, Darvish. That should be a good pitching matchup. 540. And then on Sunday, the series finale, Michael Waka, second start back. That's going to be a big one for Michael Waka, seeing how he performs in that second start. Because it's, it's good to have a good first start, but the adrenaline's probably there. And you're obviously really healthy because you just came back. But let's see how he does in the second start. TBD for the D-backs there. And then they've got three against the Marlins before going out on the road, finally, I believe, getting an off day, yes, on the 24th. It's been, it's going to be, they're in the middle of a 13 consecutive game stretch, 13 games in 13 days. So Thursday off day, and then they're, they're on the road, and they get to play the Milwaukee Brewers in Milwaukee. Kind of surprised they haven't been in Milwaukee yet, but that's the, the weirdness of the schedule. All right, on to the chat. I'm sorry, haven't gotten to the chat yet. Quick break here. And then if you want to make sure I get to your comment or your question during this break, use that super chat button for your comment or your question. And I will get to that on the other side. Stay tuned. And if you want to join the show, click that link that's pinned up at the top of the chat. I want to tell you about the best and easiest way to play fantasy sports. It's underdog fantasy. They have great pick em games and best ball tournaments. In pickup games, just pick higher or lower on two to five players' stats and you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. You can go cross team, cross league, and even cross sport. Best ball revolves around the draft, which is what every fan loves the most about fantasy, and it eliminates the hassle of having to manage your roster all season long, resulting in a fun and easy fantasy product. How does it work exactly? You enter a contest where you participate in a snake draft against other users. That lineup that you drafted competes against every other draft in the entire contest. The better the combined performance of your team, the more money you win. After your lineup is all played, Underdog will take the best performing players and automatically set them as your starting lineup. That's it. No waivers, no trades, no worrying about who to start or sit. After you complete your draft, your part is done. Underdog Fantasy offers best ball in a variety of ways, including daily contests, weekly contests, playoff contests, and season-long contests. You can either enter into these and compete against thousands of other entrants for huge prizes, 
Or if you'd like, you can enter into a private draft with friends and family to compete for a smaller prize pool. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy to use website and mobile apps. Sign up now by clicking the link in the description or by using the promo code TALKINGFRIARS and you'll double your first deposit up to $100 in bonus cash when you make your first deposit of $10 or more. So if you deposit $100, you get $100 free. If you deposit $10, you get $10 free. All right, let's end this show by going through the chat. Great Padres fans in here tonight. Thank you to you all here who are here live. I appreciate that. Going to the top of the chat and making my way through. Beast Brandon says, I'm a new subscriber. Is this actually live? Yes, it is actually live. Welcome on in, Brandon. Uh, Raul says, season might be cooked, but this was a great series. Yes, it, season might be over, but, I mean, it's not. But I think some Padres fans probably still think that it's over. Um, my viewpoint hasn't changed. Good series, encouraging, but they're going to have to keep doing it, right? That's going to be my consistent message here. It's going to be my message probably through the rest of this homestand, see how this homestand works, how it happens, and do they have success? How do they finish the homestand? It's a big homestand. You know, it's not over. The work's not done. So they've got a flush today because tomorrow when they wake up, or actually now, today doesn't matter. Like, sure, they got to win, but what matters now is the next game. That's what matters the most. Go Padres says if they make the playoffs, they could be dangerous because they can play good teams. That's true. Like, they, they can win against good teams. Yeah. I mean, they've beaten Texas. They've beaten Atlanta. They've beaten Tampa, right? And then, obviously, Baltimore here. Can't beat the Dodgers, but they beat them in the postseason last year. So, And if they make the postseason, they're going to be playing good baseball because they have to to make the postseason. So I think if they make the postseason, we're – we might think that they can beat almost anyone with the talent that they have. And hopefully everyone's healthy. Kelly says Padres are 7-2 and two against the Rangers, Rays, and Orioles, but are 5-10 and 10 against the Royals, Nationals, and Pirates. Yeah, they didn't really have much success against the Reds either. No words. That's the Padres' inconsistency, right? Good against good teams, not good against not good teams. It's weird. But... It's also not weird if you watch the team every day because you expect it, right? They play up to the competition and then they play down to the competition. And well, let's be honest, when you look through schedules in Major League Baseball, you look at the teams in Major League Baseball, you look at the teams on the Padres' schedule this season, most of the teams are not World Series contenders. So that means most of the time the Padres are playing down to their competition if that's you know what they're doing. And that's what it feels like they're doing, for sure. Pedro says he would pass on Michael Waka. I'm guessing because of the injuries, maybe he doesn't like the $6 million, 16, excuse me, $16 million number for next year and the year after that. I, I don't blame Padres fans that say no on that, but just be prepared to have to offer him a bigger deal, probably more total money in free agency if you don't take that. Or you're just going to have to bring someone else in and hope that they're just as good or better than Waka, and they don't get hurt, obviously. And Waka's gotten hurt this year, but when he's been on the mound, he's been pretty darn good. Um, LFGSD Padres says, my boy is the good camera tonight to keep it on point. Yes, I do. It's late at night. So again, for anyone that's just kind of new to this show, um, I haven't had my mic for a while. I've had the mic sitting here, but I haven't used it because it was it was either between me picking the mic or picking good internet. So I went with the internet, and so people had to deal with me just speaking into my earbuds, the external mic. And so I apologize if that didn't make the experience as good for you, but I'm back here, and this camera is technically not mine, so I'm not going to be able to use it every show because it's my mom's, but she's good enough to allow me to use it when she's not working. So thank you to her for that. Okay. NS says, giveaway night, what'd you get? Yes, it was the hoodie. The It's not like a thick hoodie, but like the, the thin pullover hoodie with the pockets, the white pinstripes. I think it looks pretty good. 
obviously I don't really like the sponsor on the side, but I know money, business, you have to have the sponsor on there. It's a giveaway. There's it's gonna be sponsored. I understand that. I, I usually I like those hoodies. Um because you can wear them to even day games because it's not like a heavy hoodie either. Uh, LFGSD Padre says negative Nancy. We believe for our faith for all day. I don't want to come off as a negative Nancy. I know I probably am a little bit, you know, Debbie Downer, uh, whatever that phrase is there. Um, but it's not like I'm doing this at the beginning of the season. I believed I was one of the more optimistic Padres fans. For those that were watching or listening to this show early in this season, a couple months in even, probably a few months in actually, I was like, I think they're going to turn it around. Like, I think the talent, at the end of the day, the talent's going to show itself. I don't believe that this team's going to continue playing like this. Yeah, they've underperformed. Yeah, stars have not performed the way they should. Yeah, there's injuries. Yeah, look how far back they are. It doesn't look good. They're still under 500, and it's June. But I just thought that the talent was going to rise above. And it hasn't happened yet, you know, overall. But maybe this is the turning point. I, I know fans love to ask that question. Is this the turning point? I don't want to say it is. I'm not going to say it is right now. It's a couple games. It's a good series. But what matters more is what they do the rest of this homestand. Because if they fall on their faces the rest of the homestand, then this series doesn't mean anything, right? So, look. I'm coming away from this series encouraged, but I'm not going to say they're back because I'm just looking at the larger sample size of this season. Pedro says, wow, you should you should come on field access, start some pregame interviews during batting practice and warm up. Yeah, but here's the thing, Pedro. Uh, the Padres, they don't allow me to do that. They don't give me a media credential to do that because they say... I can't do that because I'm not a part of a big media organization. I don't work for NBC or Fox or 97.3 The Fan or San Diego Sports 7. Yeah, San Diego Sports 760. I was about to say extra, but that, that was a while ago. Um, I don't work for that, right? I write for Gaslamp Ball, SB Nation. I do this. I, I think I have a pretty significant following. And I'd obviously be professional if I got that opportunity, but the Padres don't allow it. Even though I've interviewed Jesse Agler on the show multiple times, um, yeah, Don and Mudd have said yes. I don't know if I, I don't know if I should say this, but Don and Mudd have said that they would come on the show, uh, like in person. They said that they would come on the show, but the Padres don't allow it. So if they want to get mad at me for saying that, sorry. I mean, I'm just. Giving the fan, they asked a question, they made a comment, and those are my thoughts on it. Um, and by the way, I do understand it from from the Padres. Like, I don't want to make it seem like I'm, you know, bashing the Padres for not allowing me to have a media credential. I get it. You know, I'm 20 years old. I get it. Um, I don't, I don't work for one of those big companies, but. I feel like I've worked my butt off these last few years to uh, continue to produce great content for Padres fans. Um, and so hopefully I'll get that opportunity one day. And if I don't, well, I'll just continue having a passion for the Padres and supporting the team that we all love, right? And I appreciate the opportunities that I have gotten um, on the radio with John Schaefer, Jim Russell, San Diego Sports 760, how every Friday uh, at home they've allowed me to go on their show. Hopefully, I'll be able to do that again this coming Friday. They've allowed me to come into their uh, into the studios. And so just the relationships that I do have, like having Darnay Tripp on this show, Derek Togerson on this show, John and Jim come on this show. I've had Paul Reinder on this show before. had MLB Network people on this show before. Uh, I definitely appreciate those people uh, that take the time to allow me to talk with them uh, because I look up to all those people, you know? Um, I, I love listening to them and hearing their thoughts on the team that we all love, you know? Okay. Yeah, Iron Swan. I, already, I, I did hit on the crony catch already. It was tremendous. Full extension. Amazing. 
not surprised by it at all. But I did go, I guess I was surprised in the moment, but looking back on it, I shouldn't have been surprised that he made that play. I mean, he's, he's great on defense, I think. Super valuable. And um, he puts himself, for the most part, in the right positions. He's super smart. And <laughs> when the play happened, I literally let out like a gasp, like, oh, he just made that catch. Like, holy crap, he just made that catch. Because it was amazing, like full extension. I wish I was on like field level at that point. I was in 309, um, or 307, whatever that section is. Um, I was up there, but obviously on the Jumbotron, you could see a tremendous angle. And I'm sure those watching on television, they saw a tremendous angle on that as well. And Grish, yes, shout out to Grish. Great play, banging into the wall there. He won that battle. He didn't drop that ball. He was holding on to that thing. So credit to him there. Again, I love watching him play center field. So good. He makes it look easy. I know some fans are like, well, he's not really trying. Look how casual he is. But it's because he makes it look easy. He gets to the ball. He knows the routes for the most part. I know last year, was it was last year, right? Where he had that like bizarre week or two weeks where he was dropping pop-ups in center. And he just looked lost. But that was for a short period of time. And when you look at the big sample size with Grish, you know how good he is. Um, Iron Swan, it, it's a, yeah. Did Ben set his camera to full brightness today, or is it just me? It's it's a different. It's not my laptop camera that I usually use. That's why. That's why it looks different. Matthew asks, "Are you going tomorrow, Donna Mud Bobblehead?" I'm going on Friday to that. Yeah, because th there's two days of that. And by the way, for anyone that wants a Don and Mud bobblehead, reminder, that's a theme game. It's not just a regular giveaway. So you have to go to Padres.com, I believe, go to the theme games, and then you can get it there. And you can't get it Friday. That's sold out already. You got to get it for Thursday. So get on that quick if you want one. It's, it's for Thursday night. LFGSD Padres says, that would be cool if you were on Ben and Woods. I'm sure I could call in, uh, but they haven't had me on like as like a, a guest or anything. Uh, but I, I listen to their show every morning as well. Uh, LFGSD Padres says, bro, if you keep working as hard as you do, you will go places. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Erica, your dedication, strong work, and passion for San Diego and the Padres are very valuable, Ben. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, Glicks Picks asks, updated win total prediction for the Padres. Well, right now, they are at 58 and 63, four and a half games back of a wild card. Right now, I probably see them getting just over 80 wins. Again, like I'm not sold on this team going and, you know, playing amazing baseball the rest of the way and going and winning 87, 88 games. I don't see that. So probably a little bit over 80 and probably a few games out of a wild card spot. And hopefully they prove me wrong positively. Like they go win a ton of games. They play their best baseball that they haven't shown that they can play this season. They get a four plus game win streak and they go make the postseason. We'll see what happens there. All right. That has been Talking Friars episode 447. Thank you so much for the time, everyone. Just a reminder, seat geek code Talking Friars, $20 off Padres tickets or any sports tickets. Underdog Fantasy, click that link in the description or use code Talking Friars. You, you will get a 100% deposit match for free up to $100 when you use that code. BreakingT.com, click that link in the description. Great San Diego sports swag, Padres Wave Aztecs. And by the way, San Diego Wave, they play this weekend at home against Gotham. Don't know if the World Cup players will be playing. Uh, Morgan, Gurma, Sheridan, not 100% sure if they're going to be playing. Um, I think they'll maybe they'll get some minutes because they are back. So we'll see. We'll see if the other U.S. Women's National Team players will be playing for Gotham. Christy Mewis, Mitch Purse, she didn't make the U.S. Women's National Team, so she'll, she'll be playing. Christy Mewis, Lynn Williams, Kelly O'Hara, a lot of talent there. So should be a fun match. That is going to be on Saturday at Snapdragon Stadium. Tickets are still available, so you can get those there on the San Diego Waves website. 
Uh, and then Gaglione and Bros, check out their main location on Friars Road and also at Peco Park and Snapdragon Stadium. All right, that is it. Be on the lookout for the Jim Callis interview. I think that's going to come out on Friday. And that's it. Be well, Padres fans. Have a great rest of your night. Thank you.